studied in yogic science, and I learned from them every day. Uh, one of my great teachers here, uh, Deepak, is going to really give us insight. And what I want to say is that the reason that we call this Tantra school a school of yogic science because it is science. It's a cause and effect. If you read our yoga sutras, uh, it's just cause and effect. You do this, you get that. This is what happens when you do this. And the spiritual sciences are here for us to evolve. And it's been just separate. It's been perceived as separate from what the scientists are teaching. And now, after thousands of years, it's all this new research. The research on meditation is shocking, and Deepak just gave me more information, and he'll give you more about it. But I always say that there's this study where the left and the right side of the brain connect, and then the gray matter in the brain you can see it grow in six weeks of meditation, and, and that the aging process reverses because the caps on the cells start to come off, and instead of just shrinking, the, the cells grow, which is a reversal of aging. And all these uh, revelations are coming coming up, and there must have been uh, great scientists next to those spiritual teachers or their insight. By knowing the self, they knew the truth, and they passed it along to us. And for thousands of years, we've practiced yoga, we've studied these sciences, and now it is science, there's no doubt, because we have all this proof. And I could go on and on about all the new revelations, but Deepak will tell you about some of them. Well, I'll give you a brief story, and I'll, and I'll bring on our teacher. Um, I was once invited to teach or to speak at Deepak Center, and I got there, you know, and I always regarded him as a yogi. And today he just dispelled again, although he is, of course, a seeker uh, of yoga because everyone is, but he actually is a conscious seeker of yoga. And so he's a yogi, but I only thought of him as such. I never thought of him as a, a scientist. But when I got to his center, and I was about to speak, there was a speaker before me who was brilliant, I guess, because I had no idea what he was saying. <laughs> and everyone was writing down notes, and he was speaking, and it was so complex, I was so confused. And, I, and, and, and as I was getting more confused, something else happened. I got uncomfortable, like, what, what am I going to say to them? The book was super rich. It was about the state of needing nothing. The lofty idea of realizing yoga, um, you know, and, and all what the scriptures say, and what Krishna was taught Arjuna, and all that shit. <laughs> and I'm going to go after this guy who's this brilliant scientist. They all had suits on each other. And I'm, I'm looking for Deepak. You weren't even there. You were somewhere, but you weren't there I, I, to comfort me. <laughs> and finally, the scientist said something that was exciting, because I understood it at least. And it was exactly what all my book was about. All the pages and writing, all the bullshit, all the shit I wrote, all of that was in his, I forget what he said, but it just capsulized it. And I, and I like to say, if God were the ocean, we'd be cups of God, right? That we would all be in this idea of union. And he actually said that that was science, the quantum physicist is what he was. And it was amazing to me, and that's why I felt confident when I said, what are you gonna call this school? The school, Tantris, School of Yogic Science, because that's what it is. And we all know that the effect works for everyone without exception. That if you practice, you get happier. But then the other stuff, he's going to teach you about. But thank you so much uh, for being here. I'm very honored and thrilled that you'd come and join us. And um, you all have copies of the book? Yes. Yeah. Um, all right, well, enjoy his teaching. I'm excited to listen as well. Thank you. Deepak Chopra, everybody. Okay, so thank you, Russell. Uh, Russell is a brother for many years. Um, I deeply honor and respect uh, what he stands for and all the good that he brings to the world. Um, this is my first visit Tantris, I can assure you it won't be my last. Uh, Russell, I'm going to come for your classes once more, yeah. especially the Sunday ones. Okay, so you know, yesterday I was in a different place. It was um, a week-long uh,
conference on science of consciousness. So I gave, I think, the last uh, talk there on this subject, and it was all science. And now I'm here, and it's going to be a little science, but more yoga. Um, but I need to do justice to the science too, because that's what the book is about. And uh, the book is co-written, if you see, uh, with a physicist, a quantum physicist, but he's also a cosmologist. And he's also a climate change expert. He trained at MIT, got his uh, PhD from there, and he's now here in California at Chapman University. And so he and I co-wrote the book, and I just wanted to mention that. Let's do the science first, and then we'll go to the connection with yoga. So if you go on the internet and you type out, uh, what are the open questions in science? Open means we don't know the answers. And there's a particular issue of Science Magazine that goes back to 2007, and that's been recycled now many times because of those 125 questions that scientists are struggling to find the answer to, um, the first two are the most difficult, and I'll tell you what they are. The first question that all scientists are struggling with is, um, what is the universe made of? Okay, you'd think that's pretty simple. It's made of, you know, the sun, moon, uh, stars, galaxies, and they're made of uh, atoms and molecules and energy, uh, right? That's simple science, so you would think that's an easy uh, conundrum to solve. But the reason it's not easy is that 70% of the universe is a mysterious mathematical construct, I'm saying it very carefully, mathematical construct, uh, which fits the equations of quantum physics, what is called the standard model of physics, uh, which uh, says that 70% of the universe is invisible, invisible dark energy. What is it? Well, no one knows what it is, that's why it's the open question. But why do people think there is an invisible dark energy in the universe, which is 70% of the universe? It's because the space between galaxies is right now, as we speak, expanding faster than the speed of light. So we live in something called the Milky Way galaxy. Right next door to us is Andromeda, there's Virgo, and now scientists tell us, latest estimate, there are two trillion galaxies. Two trillion. Se 700 sextillion stars. And trillions and trillions and trillions upon trillions of planets. In fact, right now, according to many cosmologists, including my co-author, but others too, um, it is estimated that there may be 60 billion habitable planets in our own galaxy. Forget the universe, in our own galaxy. And there are two trillion galaxies. And why do they say this? Because science is a certain methodology, okay? It's uh, uh, making observations, coming up with theories. These days they're all mathematical theories, and then validating them, proving them or disproving them. And these days they can make observations because there are telescopes in the sky. You've heard about them the Hubble telescope, the James Watson telescope, and on and on, where observations are made and then transmitted to the Earth. And then based on that, scientists come up with theories, and uh, then they do experiments, and 60 billion habitable planets, theoretically at least. In fact, MIT has an app only for their internal services. Uh, where every time they discover a new planet, the app goes off. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every week. Okay, so 70%, we don't know what the universe is. Mysterious dark energy. So that leaves 30% of the universe, which is so-called material. But of that, 26% is another mysterious entity, a mathematical construct to fit the equations of physics, and it's called dark matter. 
So what is dark matter? Why is it called dark matter? Well, it's called dark <coughs> matter because it's invisible. Nobody can see it. Um, and why is it invisible? Because it doesn't reflect light, absorb light, emit light. It doesn't have anything to do with light because dark matter is not composed of atoms. You and I are composed of atoms. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, the periodic table. In fact, the atoms in our body came from stars. <coughs> All the atoms in your body right now came from stars, from different galaxies. So you are a stardust being, literally, with self-awareness. But leave that aside. We are made of atoms. Stars are made of atoms. Uh, this microphone is made of atoms. Everything that you know is made of atoms. But dark matter is not atomic. So we can't see it. Maybe we will never be able to see it because we can only see things uh, that are atomic uh, because light bounces off them. <clears throat> so now we're left with 4% of the universe, the rest being invisible, unknown, maybe unknowable to science. So 4% left. Of that, 99.99% is invisible interstellar dust. So we can't see that either. Okay, now it's thought that that invisible interstellar dust is hydrogen and helium, but the point is we can't see it. So the visible universe is 0.01%. That's <coughs> 2 trillion galaxies, 700 sextillion stars, and trillions of planets is 0.01%. The rest is unknown and maybe unknowable. How do you, how do you look at something that's invisible, right? So the visible universe is 0.01% made of atoms. But here's the problem. When you start to look at atoms, you say, what are they made of? Atoms are made of particles. And if you know, you keep up with the literature, everyone's heard of electrons, photons, protons, neutrons. Now there are many particles, quarks, etc. So what are they made of, the particles? Well, particles, when you get down to the very minutest particles, or even bigger particles, even electrons, they have a dual nature. When, and I'm going to simplify this because, you know, don't worry. I know there will be scientists watching this who will say, gotcha, if I say something. <laughs> even minor. So, never mind, you can get me. Okay, I'm going to simplify this. Here's the thing with atoms. When you're looking at them, they appear as particles. But when you're not looking th at them, they disappear into waves. Or when a particle is interacting with another particle, you know, it's in exchanging energy with another particle, then it's there. But if it doesn't have a relationship, and I'm simplifying this, and sorry guys who are watching uh, this, and would say gotcha, because you know, there are minor nuances to this. But when a particle is not interacting uh, with another particle, it disappears into what is called a wave, a wave. So particles have a location in space-time. You can measure them, you can weigh them, small, minute things. But waves uh, do not have any location. So you say, where are they? And what are they made of? See, because if you go to the ocean, you say, what are those Ocean waves made of? Answer is simple. They're made of water. Right? What are the sound waves that are coming from me to you made of? Answer is simple. Vibration of air molecules. But what are the waves that make the universe, ultimately the visible universe, made of? And the best answer you'll get from science is they're made of possibilities. Okay? So then you go and say, where, where are these waves of possibility? And they'll say, oh yeah, they're in Hilbert space. And then, you know, you try to figure this out. You say, what is Hilbert space? You learn that Hilbert space is a space, mathematical, <laughs> named after a mathematician called Hilbert. <laughs> so then you say, where is it? You know, oh, it's a multi-dimensional infinite space. Okay, got it, but where is it? <laughs> and the best answer you'll get in science today is shut up and calculate. 
Because <laughs> it's a mathematical space. You can't see it. No one knows where it is. It houses what they call the wave function, the quantum fluctuation from which the universe that we are in presumably comes. So then, bottom line, what's the universe made of? 70% dark energy, 26% uh, dark matter, 4% atoms, 99.99% .99 invisible interstellar dust, 0 0.01 atoms, which it turns out also are waves of possibility, and we don't know where they are. Okay, so bottom line, once again, if you ask scientists, what's the universe made of? They'll say the best answer is, it's made of nothing. <laughs> okay, then you say, then how did nothing become everything? And they say, we're trying to figure it out. That's why it's, it's an open question. Okay, so everything I've said now comes down to one conclusion. The universe is made of nothing. Which, by the way, is an ancient idea. Sufi poets have said, Vedantists have said this. In the Vedanta, they call it Chit Akash. Akash means infinite space, and Chit means consciousness, made of consciousness. You can call it cosmic consciousness. But we won't go there right now, okay? <coughs> the universe comes from nothingness and becomes everything. Everything that you look at, the stars, galaxies, sun, moon, everything comes from nothing. So if you heard uh, Rumi's favorite, uh, my favorite poems of Rumi, he says, uh, beyond all ideas of right and wrong, there's a field, I'll meet you there. And he says, uh, we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. Look at these words, spinning out of nothingness, this could be you. So people have thought about these things without the math, without the physics. So that's the first open question. I'm only going to do two open questions, and if Russell invites me, we'll finish the remaining 123 <laughs> later. <laughs> so <coughs> what's the second open question? And that is, what's the biological basis of consciousness? Okay, now we'll see what's the connection between those two. So to simplify that, how does your brain produce experience? Okay, so right now, just close your eyes for a second and think of a beautiful sunset on the ocean. Okay, you can open your eyes. Did you see a picture? There's no picture in your brain. Okay, so where is the picture you just saw? Okay. All what's in the brain? Electrochemistry, chemicals. So, but you had an experience. Think of your favorite song. Think of John Lennon singing Imagine or whatever. <coughs> you hear it? Okay. There's no sound in your brain. Okay. You have thoughts. You listen to your thoughts, right? Nobody knows where they come from in the brain. Just electrochemistry. So no mental experience can be understood by science today, neuroscience. It's my field, neuroendocrinology and neuroscience. It's called the hard problem of consciousness. And the reason it's called the hard problem of consciousness, there's an easy problem <coughs> to solve. And the easy problem is, if you have a thought, or you imagine something, or you feel something, um, there's an electrochemical activity in your brain, and that's called a neural correlate of experience, of mental experience. So, a neural correlate means that when you're having the experience, something is happening in the brain. Now, what's happening? Electrochemistry. But how does it cause the experience? No one knows. That's mental experience. But now, let's look at uh, perceptual experience. Because right now, you're, you're looking at me, and you can see this guy standing here, right? So, according to science, what's happening? Photons are bouncing of this body, photons themselves are colorless. Okay? They go into your eyes, they go through your eyes, they get inverted, and then they hit your retina, 
which is about a little bit back of your eyes. It's about 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. Your eyes are nine centimeters or so apart. And there's chemical reactions happening there. And that sends an electrical current to the brain. There's chemistry again. But you don't experience that. You see this guy standing here. You see this room. You see your own self. You see the building outside. How does that happen? Again, scientists can identify what they call neural correlates, but they can't explain how experience occurs. Okay, so we can't explain how any experience occurs. That's a big problem, right? You can't explain mental experience through the brain. You can't explain physical experience, perceptual experience, by looking at the brain. So that's a problem. In fact, everything that we call sound, which you're hearing right now, this sound, there's no sound in your brain. Okay, there's no color in your brain. There's no shape. There's no texture. There's no smell. There's no taste. There's nothing that we call reality in the brain. So what's in the brain? Again, electrochemistry. So now we have a huge problem. Okay, we can't explain what the universe is made of, but we also can't explain why it looks like this, and how does it look like this if it's all being done in the brain? You know, and we presume that brain is where experience is occurring. Why? Because if you knock somebody on the head, they lose consciousness. If you give them anesthesia, they lose consciousness. If they die, at least current sciences, they're gone, right? So, and yet we can't explain how the brain does that. So maybe the brain doesn't do that, okay? So now we come to the yogi part. Like one more thing about the scientific part. Okay, so if I ask you where are you right now? Raise your hand. Everybody says, I'm here, right? <laughs> and what is, what is not me is somewhere here, right? And not me is somewhere there. Everybody agree? Okay, so then there's cognitive scientists who study the brain. They say, where in you, where in you are you having the experience of seeing me? Now I'll shorten this for you. Because many people say through the eyes, in the eyes. And then, of course, I just told you, your eyes are 2.5 centimeters, 2.5 centimeters, your retina is curved, and it's 10 centimeters apart. So if actually you're seeing me, you should see me about this size, and two of me about this uh, far apart, upside down and curved. Well, <laughs> it's not happening. Then most people would say, well, it's happening in my brain, and the answer is, how does, do I fit inside your brain? Your brain is 10 centimeters, by 14 centimeters, by 7 centimeters. All this called, the card is goo. It's like jello, and there's a little chemistry there. But how does all this fit inside your brain? Okay, that's called the heart problem of consciousness. So let me tell you what the solution is, okay? The solution is yoga for the simple reason <laughs> that if you read, if you read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which I'm sure is part of every teaching, and also uh, many people chant the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, yeah, the first sentence in, in yoga, the first sentence, Yog Chit Priti Nirod. So yoga is for getting in touch with the consciousness from where the excitations of consciousness are coming. Okay, so chit means consciousness or awareness. Vritti is the excitations. And yoga is to get to the source of those excitations. And what is the source of, that, of those excitations? It's you as a conscious being. Okay, and so when those, when consciousness gets excited, why does it get excited? Because it wants experience, right? It wants this experience, it wants to fall in love, it wants to 
taste strawberry ice cream, it wants to listen to a good song. So consciousness vibrates within itself. And the first thing it produces is what we call sense perceptions. Sense perceptions. And those sense perceptions are the vrittis of consciousness, the excitations of consciousness. It, it vibrates a sound, form, color, taste, smell, everything that we call the physical universe, including our own body, because our body is the vibration of our consciousness. Okay, so the first thing it does is it knows itself as a perception, sound, touch, sight, taste, smell. The second thing consciousness decides is it, um, is it pleasurable or is it painful? Okay, so if it's pleasurable, unless, you know, uh, you're crazy, you say, I'll go for it. And if it's unpleasurable, you say, I won't. And of course, people get addicted to pleasure and they also get addicted to suffering, but that's a different story. But, you know, as a baby, if you're exposed to something, First you experience it, a sound, touch, sight, taste, smell. And then what do you do? You decide whether you should play with it, taste it, smell it, or if you don't like it, you throw it away. So the second thing that appears is, first is perception, second is rudimentary feelings, which ultimately become emotions, okay? The third thing that happens is thought. So thought comes after that in a sense, because thought is the interpretation of experience. Okay, this is good, this is bad, this is joyful, this is not, uh, this is something I could love, or something I'm afraid of, etc., etc. Okay, so thought comes to us. But in any case, our perceptions are emotions, and our thoughts are modifications of of modified forms of consciousness wanting to have an experience. Okay. So consciousness wants to have an experience, it gets excited within its own self, and it produces everything that we call reality. Everything that we call reality. If there is a reality outside of consciousness, we'll never know it. So why call this book You Are the Universe? Is it a metaphor? No, no, I'm talking very literally. So I don't know how many of you heard the Sanskrit phrase, Aham Brahmasmi. Anyone? Okay, Aham Brahmasmi means I am the universe. Brahmasmi, I am the universe. Brahman is consciousness and Brahman is the vibration of consciousness that appears as the universe. So cosmic consciousness vibrates as the universe, as you, me, everything that we call reality. There's another phrase, Tattva Masi, Sanskrit, uh, which says, I am that, you are that, all this is that, that's alone, that alone is. Okay, these are called Mahavakyas, the big ideas of Vedanta. You find them in Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, Yoga Vashishta, etc., etc. Okay, so now let me do an experiment with you. A couple of experiments. What's this? Water. Okay, bottle of water. <laughs> What's this? What's this? What is this? What is this? Okay. So, you're all wrong. <laughs> The label microphone, the label watch, actually it's a Fitbit, but whatever. The label Fitbit, the label hand, the label body is a human construct. Now, let me tell you what that means, okay? If you, if you showed any of these items to a baby, who had no idea that we have words for this, the baby would pick it up, it would experience sound, texture, taste, smell. It would play with it, it would decide whether it's pleasurable or not. 
etc., etc., till uh, mother comes along, her father comes along and says, you know, that's a watch, don't put it in your mouth. You're not supposed to eat it, that's a watch. So now you have taken the raw experience, which is a modification of consciousness, and you've given it a construct, that's a watch. Then she'll say, maybe, or I'll say, that's your hand, that's your body. And you know that, that other one, that's Deepak's body. Yeah, you see that out there, that's a building. You see that out there, there's a star there. There's earth, there's moon. So suddenly you've replaced, which is a good thing by the way, because without those labels, we wouldn't know how to navigate our experience of reality. If I tell you I'll meet you at the corner of 56th and Broadway at 12 noon on Tuesday, and we go to Serafina and have a Caesar salad, <laughs> do you realize every one of those things is a construct? We made it up. 56th and Broadway, who says, right? <laughs> 12 noon, Tuesday, these are human constructs for what? For the interpretation of experiences in consciousness. You get it? Okay, so everything that we call reality, everything that you can give a name to, anything you can give a name to, is the creation of the human mind. Including the idea that your mind and your body and there's a universe. Because if you didn't have a name for it, it would be just experience in consciousness. And what would it be? Color and taste and smell and delight and joy and pleasure and all the things that we call life. But the universe that you and I know, which science knows, is a human construct. That's why they're having a problem. Tell them, what's it made of? Nothing. So why does it look like this? No, no. <laughs> so, you see, we made it up. This is called Maya. This is called Lila. The play of consciousness. Okay, Maya, by the way, means veil. God puts on a veil. Or the goddess, actually Maya is a goddess, so sorry. So, she puts on a veil. And then you see this instead of what's actually vibrating as this. And yoga is to actually lift the veil so you can go back and see where it's coming from. Okay. That's Raj Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Karma Yoga. You know enough about that, so I'm not going to talk about it right now. But you know, the practice you do in the morning is Raj Yoga, it's a form of Hatha Yoga, is Raj Yoga, along with pranayam and all that, but you know the eight limbs of yoga, I'm sure. You know, the eight limbs of yoga, yama, niyama, dhyan, dharma, samadhi, pratyahara, pranayam, and all these amazing techniques that allow us to get in touch with the source. The source of the individual, but also the source of the universe. Again, which is also totally in the Vedanta. This, the self of the individual is the self of the universe. Okay, so when you get to the source of your own self, then you get to the source of all there is. Okay? Because all there is, is modifications of consciousness that humans have given constructs to. Only humans give constructs. So I'm sure other species have experiences, but we don't know what they are, right? What does the world look like? to an insect with a hundred eyes? What does it look like to a dolphin? What does it look like to a bat that echoes, that navigates the world through the echo of ultrasound? What does it look like to a snake that only knows infrared radiation? So we have no idea what the world looks like to other species because we are one particular species of consciousness. And if there are planets, habitable planets, there may be other species of consciousness which are far ahead of us. I call them meta-humans. And actually, uh, Patanjali talks about them, or that whole realm of existence, where he says, have you heard of the chapters on Siddhis and Vidhis? Yes? Okay. So, Siddhis are so-called supernormal powers. You know, people can 
uh, see things in the distance or hear things in the distance, clairvoyance, prophecy, precognition, knowing past lives, knowing the future, remote healing, all bizarre stuff, which you know a lot of people call it psychic stuff, which is a dangerous word if you're with scientists, so I never use that. So I call them non-local dorm dormant potentials, uh, which is another satisfactory word, but now science is beginning to look at that. Because Patanjali says, if you have the combination of dhyana, dhyana is meditation, dharna, focused awareness, and samadhi, which is transcendence, then you can access this domain, which is beyond space and time, and you will be able to perform, again, very carefully, so-called miracles, okay? Miracles, we say, the word when we don't have an explanation. If you have an ex once you have an explanation, you can call it science. Okay? That's the only difference. So, yesterday's miracles become today's science. And these are paranormal abilities that now cognitive scientists, some of them, not all of them, are beginning to study. Why? Because there are yogis who have these abilities, or there are children who have these abilities, even though maybe they were yogis in another lifetime, but they, right now they never got this education. But Patanjali says you can uh, learn these techniques. By the way, we teach them, love to do that sometime, yeah. or whatever. Okay, so, <laughs> so yoga is the key. Raj Yoga with all the eight limbs of yoga, Bhakti Yoga, which is all the chanting and all the mantras that uh, we do with devotion to the divine, and then Gyan Yoga, which is try to understand how science works. And that's also an activity of the mind, right? Science is also an activity of the mind. Even though science cannot explain the mind, we need the mind to do science. So that's called Gyan Yoga, and then the final is Karma Yoga, which is to do what needs to be done, leaving the results to the unknown. So when you do that, you're in flow. There's no anticipation, there's no regrets, there's no resistance, just this moment, as it is. Okay, so in the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is do a couple of things to show you how this is not uh, so difficult, okay? There are many teachers in the world of non-duality. So, but in India, in the last hundred years, there were three luminaries that were as good as anybody in all of history. All of history. One was Ramana Maharishi, okay? And he passed away in 1950. The second was Nisargadatta Maharaj. Nisargadatta Maharaj, he also passed away in the last century. And the third was um, somebody called Atmananda Krishna Menon, who's also not uh, in this domain right now. But you know, there are many teachers that have come from India, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, Yogananda, etc. Their own Sachita Nanda Tadasi, but these three are considered luminaries of all time. Okay? Uh, as big as the luminaries of, of the Upanishads and the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, etc. So they're called non dual teachers, which they say that everything in the universe is made out of consciousness. The mind is made out of consciousness, the body is made out of consciousness, the universe is made out of consciousness. So, how do you define consciousness? And the answer is, uh, and the many Western teachers have actually even further refined the definitions of consciousness so people can understand them. So I, I hang out with some of these guys like Rupert Spira, Lucille Francis, who's in France and now in San Diego and many others. So, so here's what they say, and which is very close to what we've learned from the Upanishads. Paper, liquid, solid, and then everything that's made out of solid are one substance. So too, mind, body, universe are one substance.
we have the fundamental knowing of anything. Every conscious being is aware, right? So consciousness, awareness of the same consciousness. It's okay, it's back. So consciousness, <laughs> consciousness, <laughs> that's called the stiddhi. <laughs> consciousness, awareness are the same thing. Now, you know, in, in spiritual traditions, they use, unless it's the yogic tradition, they don't use these words, they call it spirit. So I'm comfortable with that, okay? Spirit, consciousness, awareness are the same entity. So now I'm going to try something with you, which is very popular. Many teachers uh, use it. Um, I'm indebted uh, for some of these techniques to Rupert Spira, but we'll come to that and many other friends that I meet at the Science and Non-Duality uh, Conference. Let me ask you something right now. I'm going to ask you a question, and, and the answer, by the way, to the question is yes. Okay, so when I ask you the question, just say yes. Agree? Yes. No, no, I haven't asked the question. But here's the question. The question is, are you aware? Yes. A little more enthusiastically. Are you aware? Yes. Okay, now we're going to do a little experiment. I'm going to ask you the same question. Same question. But this time, don't answer it until I raise my hand. Agreed? So it's the same question, but when I raise my hand, you can also say yes. Are you aware? Yes! So here it is. Are you aware is a thought, it's a mind. The answer yes is a thought, it's also a mind. But in between, there's a presence which is you. Call it consciousness, soul, spirit, awareness, doesn't matter. I prefer you again. The question this time, don't answer it. Don't answer it. At all. Just slip into it. Are you aware? So this awareness is who you really are. If you want to use the word soul, that's alright, because embedded in this, there is karma, memories, desires, but they're all unmanifest. They're all there, but they haven't manifested. Till we have an experience, okay? And what is experience? Thought, emotions, perception. Period. If you want to remember this, S-I-F-T. Sensations, images, feelings, thoughts. Period. When I say sensations, sense perceptions. And what are they? They're the manifestations of your soul. Okay, but of course we all have different experiences because of this thing called karma, which is past experiences. And what the choices we make, consciously or unconsciously. Okay, so I'm going to conclude now with a little bit more insight. If you study these great scriptures from where yoga comes, you will hear of the expression, the five kleshas. So the five kleshas are the causes of human suffering. The causes of human suffering. Great, great sages have thought about this ever since, you know, if you read the book, you'll see it starts with Einstein and Tagore going back to discussions of ancient times. But people have asked, you know, even in the Old Testament, Job is a really good person and he still suffers, right? Why do good people have to suffer? So the Buddha, of course, went way beyond when he said life contains suffering. And maybe you know the story of the Buddha. He was a young prince, he was only 19 or 20, and his father didn't want him to suffer, so he brought him up in a beautiful palace, and you know, all beautiful courtesans, and dancers, and music, and all the pleasures of the material world. Till one day the young prince, uh, who's not the Buddha yet, he went out 
with his friend Chana, who's a stable boy. And the first night uh, uh, when they were out, uh, uh, the young Gautama Buddha saw a very old man who bent over in extreme decrepitude. And Buddha's father, the young prince's father, who's a king, emperor, he had made sure that the boy would never see old age. So this looked like a shock to the boy. And he said to his friend, he said, what's that? The friend said, that's a very old man with extreme decrepitude. So uh, the prince said, uh, does that happen to everyone? <laughs> and Chana said, if you live long enough, yeah, sure, it happens to everyone. So that was the first day. The second day, they saw a man with extreme disease, and uh, again, same question, he said, uh, does that happen to everyone? He said, yeah, if you feed them long enough, you know, sometimes you get these things. And the third day, when they uh, went out, they saw a person going to the funeral with fire commission, and the young prince had never seen uh, death. A dead body. So what's that? And Chana said, that's a dead person. So does everybody die? And he said, yes. And that's the first time that the prince said, will I die? And uh, Chana, his friend said, yes, we will. Okay, so that started the search, which is the ancient search of humanity. So if you go to the Vedas, the Vedanta, this is, there are five causes of human suffering. They didn't say that life is suffering, they said life contains suffering, right? life contains joy. Life contains everything, right? But suffering is part of it. So, the Vedanta says there are five causes, five pleasures that cause human suffering. The first is, you don't know who you are. Okay? You mistake your body and your mind and your experiences for who you are. The second is, you're trying to hold on to something that doesn't exist. And what is that? It's every experience. Okay, so the experience you had this morning doesn't exist right now, right? The experience you had yesterday doesn't exist at this moment. So the experience you had five seconds ago is also gone. Actually, by the time you hear my voice, it's gone. Right? So the past is not here, the future is not here. Now believe it or not, the present you can't hold on to it because it's over before you even experience it. That's why a German philosopher Heidegger, he's not Heidegger, sorry, Wittgenstein, he said our life is a dream. We are asleep, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming too. Okay? Our life is a dream, we are asleep, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. And what do we wake up to? The presence in which the dream is happening, the soul. And that's called awakening. Right? So once again, as you listen to me, just turn your attention to who's listening. That's the presence in which this dream is happening. Okay, so don't mistake the movie for the light of awareness in which this movie is happening. In other words, don't sacrifice yourself for your selfie. <laughs> <laughs> this is a selfie. Yeah? This is a selfie. Okay, so that's the second. You're holding on to something that doesn't exist. The third is, same thing, a fear of impermanence. The fourth is identifying with your ego, which is also a socially induced hallucination. It doesn't actually exist. If I go inside your body, there's no little deep up there, or there. You know, there's no one looking out through the screen at the world. And yet we have this feeling, oh, there's me here inside. No such thing. In fact, your body is an experience in you. Your mind is an experience in you. And what we call the universe is an experience in you. So we started with Lord Krishna, it says, Prakratim Svam Vashtabhai, 
Vishra Jami, Puna Puna, curving back within myself, I create again and again. I create the mind, I create the body, I create the whole universe. And I is not yet ego, it's what's behind the ego that is modifying itself as the ego. Okay, so that's the fourth cause of suffering. And the fifth is the fear of death. And the fear of death is because we mistake the experience for the reality. Reality is not an experience for the consciousness in which the experience is happening. So if you want, I can do five, ten minute meditation. Can I do it right now? Okay, that will maybe give you an experience. Yes? Okay. Please, can I take uh, ten minutes? Fifteen? Ten? Okay. Okay. So let's do it, okay? Okay. So close your eyes. Sit uh, as comfortably as you can. And we'll start just with the breath, okay? So observe your breath. This is what the Buddha was doing when he, when he which he later called the Vipassana. He was just observing his breath. What did he realize? He realized that the breath arises and subsides by itself. He also realized you cannot hold on to the breath. If you do, you'll suffocate. So breath is the experience in these sensations. Put your awareness on your skin touching your clothes or your buttocks touching the mat or the floor. Just be aware of sensations. Notice that just like the breath, sensations rise and subside of their own. You cannot hold on to them. They are an arising and a subsiding. They are not the sensations, you are the observer of those sensations. attention to sound, the sound of my voice, there's a faint hum in this room, the sound of the occasional cough, just be aware of sound. Once again, notice that the sound is intermittent. You hear it, and then there are gaps when you don't hear it. You hear my voice, and there are little gaps between these words, where there is no sound. Or any other sound. Not hold on to the sound. You are the observer in the sound. The experience of the sound. Let's try an image. Uh, evoke the image of, uh, of a candle in the dark room. Suddenly there's an image in your consciousness, but um, you can't go on to it because in and out. You're not the image, you're the observer of the image. The image, the sound, the sensation, the breath, they arise and they subside. But you are always there. You're there. The experience arises. You are there during the experience, and you are there after the experience is gone. And that tells us that the experience is in time, but the observer of the experience is not in time. Okay. 
Okay, so we'll go a little step further now. Bring your awareness to your heart. And mentally ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? Not looking for any answer, just ask. Of course, there will be a sensation, an image, a feeling, a thought. Just watch it. Who am I? Who wants to know that? Who wants to know who am I? What is it that wants to know? Mentally, repeat your full name to yourself. I am Deepa Chopra. into your awareness all the things that are happening in your life, the good and the bad, whatever is happening, allow it to come into your awareness now. There's so many good things happening, but there are challenges, there's work, there's stress, there's money. So allow it all to come into your awareness.
Let go of your last name and just repeat your first name. I'm Deepa. I'm Russell. I'm Karen. I'm John. I'm Elizabeth. Just the first name. And now, allow experiences from your childhood of your teenage years to come into your room. Your home, your parents, your school, your classmates, siblings, anything, whatever comes. Memories from a long time ago when you were a child. Let go of your first name and just repeat to yourself, I am. With no name and no form attached to it. Just I am. And as you repeat I am, let memories and thoughts slowly fade out. If you want now, if you prefer a mantra, then say Aham, Aham. Or you may have another mantra, so of course the mantra. Let the mantra go and just rest in being. Just rest in awareness. Just rest in existence. No mantra, no thought, just being. That's who we are. Just rest there. Rest in you. Before we come on to the reflection into inquiry, ask yourself, does being have a religion? Does being have a race? How old it's been? 23 years old, 6 years old, 70 years old.
Question is being in time, or is it timeless? The real you is not in time. So again, because you started with Bhagavad Gita and Lord Krishna, says the water cannot wet it, wind cannot dry it, weapons cannot shatter it, fire cannot burn it, which is ancient, it was never born, and therefore it is not subject to death. I am Deepak Chopra, is in time. I am Deepak and that child. How many people could remember something from their childhood? Everyone, right? Where was that? It wasn't in your brain, it was, in your, it was part of your soul, sanskara, karma, whatever. Yeah. But we could bring it forth just by thinking. So I am Deepak Chopra, is in time. I am Deepak the child, is also in time then I am is not in time. Right? So that's why when Moses goes to God at the burning bush and he says, what's your name? And the God says, I am the diamond. Or Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Right? Because Abraham was in time. I am not in time. And he's not referring to the personality Jesus. He's referring to the I am before the name and form comes. So as we go deeper and deeper, all that's left is being, which is who we are. The being has no shape, no color, no texture, no smell, no form, but without it there would be none of this, this form, this color, this taste, this texture. So that's what, again, the Vedanta says, that which cannot be seen, but without which there is no seen. That which cannot be perceived in any form, heard, touched, tasted, but without which there is no perception. That which we cannot be imagined, but without which there is no imagination. That which cannot be conceived, but without which there is no concept of thought. That is who you are, that from us. And the purpose of yoga in all its dimensions is to discover reality. And then all those other things, you know, fear, impermanence, ego, death, they don't mean anything because death doesn't happen to you. Death happens to an experience. Your body is an experience in you. Your mind is an experience in you. This is an experience. And if you actually put it all together, it's just a bunch of sensations, images, feelings, thoughts. And where are they coming from? They're the excitations of your own being. Why? Because you want to have an experience. Otherwise, you get bored. Okay, thank you.
put in? No, hey, folks, you can help there. Okay. So thank you all for coming. Um, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. I am that. So hum, so hum. Said it right? I am that. Uh, that's all the, the idea of uncovering the noise, the separation, and the, 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 un, the untruth. Lead me to the truth, the self. So this is what we talk about every day, but then there's the science. And I'm very fascinated by it, and, and I hope you read the book and, and share it with your friends, because uh, the more people wake up, then there's something to dig for. They say if you should seek anything, you should seek yoga. Right? This is this thing. And uh, that's where happiness exists. That's where our uh, uh, gift to give uh, lights up. And we want to, as yogis, who are extraordinary people, exude yoga. And, and now we have our science to back us up. So thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you.